The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Sam! Most of the day is gone and you haven't even come into the office. I slept in, Effie. Did you have a busy night? Rather. Didn't you read the papers today? What? Oh, I've given up reading the papers. They're so full of bad news lately. Well, they're especially full of bad news today, Eff. What happened? Oh. Did your bowling team lose again? Effie, I'll thank you not to mention my bowling team in public. It's just a matter of getting a little exercise. And it didn't lose. It won, even without me. It only seems to win when you don't play on it, Sam. Effie, don't forget your position. Sorry, Sam. Anyway, how do we get on this bowling kick? We're supposed to be talking about something else. About last night. Oh, yes. Well... Well, this one has more than local uh, complications. Intrigue, F, foreign correspondence. Dirty work on a grand scale. It's international in scope. You'll chill with me. You'll thrill with me. Half rogue and half renegade. It's Sam Spade in the Red Star Caper. <laughs> For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Effie? Uh, yes, Sam? Ah, I'm here. It's about time. Well, I'm here. It's about time. Effie, you sound more like a shrew every day. Thank you, Sam. I'm just being practical, you know. How can we make money if you don't show up? Well, I had to turn away three clients today. Well, that's like... I'm thinking of quitting private detecting anyway. You are? Really? What would you do? Well, well, I know a reporter's job that's open. Now, how would that sound? Scoop spade. My beat is the universe. Oh, that sounds terrible, Sam. You make a silly reporter. You can't even type. Sometimes, Effie, you hit the nail right on the point where it hurts. Now, let's get down to business. Well, I hope I didn't offend you, Sam. Well, watch us. Date January 12th, 1951. Two Lieutenant I.C. Kelsey homicide detail, San Francisco Police. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Red Star Caper. Dear Kelsey, it had been some time since I had attended a lecture. In fact, the last one I can remember is when Margaret Sanger passed through town. But last night at 8 o'clock, I filed into the Central Municipal Auditorium along with several hundred other people, including college students, newspaper men, professors of political science, the usual curious compliment, and a goodly sprinkling of snuffling indigents who welcomed any easy means of escaping the cold wind that whooped through the Mission District at this time of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to see so many politically-minded faces gathered in this auditorium tonight. To let the world know that so many of us are trying to keep abreast of the fast-moving and sometimes confusing events of our troubled days serves as a graphic example to those who would try to take our liberties away from us that we are ever alert and that we will continue to defend those liberties. Only by taking every opportunity to display our willingness to understand and act on the problems that face us can we serve notice to the world that we are ever ready to pick up the gauntlet of international challenge whenever or wherever it may be thrown down. The subject for tonight is, are we helping our enemies? And our speaker scarcely needs introduction. But just in case there are a few hermits in our audience who have never owned a radio set nor seen a newspaper in the past ten years. <laughs> well, just in case there are, let me introduce a man who really needs no introduction, the most distinguished foreign correspondent, Cyrus Manning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Are we helping our enemies? That is the question. My answer in a word is yes. And that answer is not hasty or ill advised. I have just returned from a thorough coverage of the Orient. I have visited the tragic blood soaked battlefields of Korea. I've talked with the military leaders of the armed camp of Formosa. 
I've trod the nervous defense, the soil of the Philippines and Japan. And I have even made two secret trips, incognito, right into the bastion of the communist stronghold on the China mainland. Wow. <laughs> and this is my report. This materially from this very city, shipments are being made regularly to Red China. <laughs> I was sitting halfway up the hall when the lights went out. I cut for a side aisle and raced for the stage. Someone was running for a back exit, and I followed. I was too late. The car had roared out of a back alley and was gone. On the stage, someone had rung down the curtain. Cyrus Manning was on the floor, and the chairman was bending over him. He's dead. They almost shot me, too. Let me see. Yeah, you're right. There's nothing anybody can do for him right now. The lights went out, and then the shots. Oh, this is the most terrible thing that ever happened to me. To you. Shall I ask him to get up and call the police, or do you think that with one last dying effort you might do well, it? I'll call him. I'll call him. I guess he did get the worst of it. I guess he did. And that's how the news reached you, Kelsey. Now, I suppose you want to know how I happen to be at a lecture where the lecturer happened to be shot. Well, I'll tell you, and don't think it makes me happy. You see, I was supposed to be his bodyguard. Now, let's start at the beginning, shall we? It's early afternoon. Our stupid hero is sitting around trying to break the code on a scratch sheet. Sam, are you in? Oh, only the clients, F. Who is it? Dick Davis, foreign news editor on the Tribune. Well, he probably has me confused with Mr. X, but I'll take it. Yeah, Dick? You ever hear of Cyrus Manning, Sam? The foreign correspondent? Yeah, that's the one. He's in town. He got here yesterday. Well, what is it, a benefit? You want me to do card tricks or something? He needs a bodyguard. I don't know anybody else who would be crazy enough to take the job, so I called you. Oh, gee, thanks. Read the letters to the editor column tomorrow for my reply. I didn't know whether you'd take the job, but I sent him over to see you anyway. Who does he want to be bodyguarded against? Well, I'll let him tell you about it, Sam, but I'll give you a clue. Their home base runs west from the center of Berlin, east to slightly below the 38th parallel. Oh, those people, huh? Well, there are only two or three hundred million of them. I shouldn't have any trouble. Then you'll take the job, Sam? Who's paying? We are. Fifty a day. Sixty. Haven't you heard of the cost of living index? Yeah, all right. It's a deal. Good. Uh, just one thing, Sam. If uh, you have a good picture of yourself taken recently, kid, we'd uh, appreciate a copy. Why? Probably. Well, that is possible obituary. Davis, what are you saying? If I don't see you again, Sam, good luck. I quit. I won't take the job. Davis! Effie! I'm leaving town for a few days, F. Look, throw some things in my suitcase in the closet. All right, Sam. But wait, there's someone here to see you. I don't suppose his name is Cyrus Manning. How did you ever guess, Sam? Oh, it was easy, easy. I just thought of a name of a man I would least like to see. Send him in. Sam, sometimes I just can't understand you. I have the same trouble, F. I'll send him in and forget about the suitcase. I am not going to succumb to hysteria. Are you sure you're all right? Of course I am. In these troubled times, we must keep our heads cool and our powder dry. Well, I try to. Now, send them in. All right. You may come in now, Mr. Barry. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. Well, how do you do, Spade? Sit down, sit down. Oh, thank you, old man. You, uh... Could you lift up your hat brim so I could see your face and, uh, maybe even take off your trench? Coat? Oh, I never take them off, Spade. Oh? They're the mark of my profession. Oh. The life of a foreign correspondent isn't his own, you know. I might be whisked off to Berlin or Siberia in a matter of minutes. Sometimes I even sleep in these clothes. Well, you know best. I wore this trench coat when I interviewed Hitler. When I stood knee-deep in water on the shores of the Philippines. Next to MacArthur. Really? Why, the commandant of the prison camp didn't dare take it off of me when I was captured by the Chinese guerrillas. And when Mussolini... Would you care for a drink? Uh, drink? Yeah. Here. Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. I see you pour him deep. Well, here's the crime. Uh, no, no, Spade, no. Just a minute. I never drink without first offering special toast. Offer. Ah, oh, may the great white wings of the Thunderbird brush lightly over your grave. <laughs> a literal translation of an old Tibetan toast. Swell, swell. Of course, it probably loses something in the translation. Ah, oh, it's good to get back to the States where they have real liquor. I'm getting tired of sake and Korean moonshine. I didn't know they had time to make it. Well, <clears throat> let's get down to business, Spade. This is my problem. Hmm. I have been no respecter of censorship or official red tape. 
That's why I scored some of my biggest news beats. I take it you're working on one now. Oh, the biggest. Did you know that material is being shipped out of San Francisco to the Chinese Communist forces? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Stuff that they are even now using against us on the battlefield? Well, no, I didn't, but I could believe it. Well, for weeks now, I have been tracking down the truth, documenting the facts, ferreting out the cover-ups, the lies, the falsehoods. Well, good for you. Now, tonight, tonight I'm giving a lecture at the Central Municipal Auditorium. Press representatives from every newspaper and syndicate will be there. Of course. I, uh, well, I'll give the general outline of my revelations, and it'll hit every newspaper in the country. Then, when the public's appetite is whetted, I'll publish the specific details in the Tribune the following day, and we'll score a clean scoop. I see, and you feel somebody's gunning for you. I know they are. Anybody specific? I'm... I'm not at liberty to name names just now. Oh. But after I give my first lecture tonight, it might be dirty for me. Mm. Well, the Tribune's hired me, and I'll do my best. I've been in tight spots before, Spade, but my duty is clear before me, and I'll not shirk it. I won't need you before the lecture, oh? but immediately after, your services will be appreciated. Well, why don't I stick with the starting right now? Now, after the lecture will be soon enough. You know best? They think I'm afraid to talk, but I guess I'm going to give them a surprise, huh? Yeah, yeah. One that they can read in their morning newspapers, huh, Spade? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was half right, Kelsey. Might not have been a surprise, but they were able to read it in the morning papers. And at least Manning got a laugh out of it, which is more than I did. You arrived at the murder scene three minutes after you were called. He was shot, Sam. I would say so, Kelsey. I would say so. Well, and it's easy. We'll search everybody in the audience before we let them go. Kelsey, I was in the audience. Manning was shot from backstage, and whoever did it ran out the back door. Oh, that's right, Sam. You already told me that. That, that makes it a little harder. Yeah. Uh, now, look, Kelsey, the yeah. doorman is sitting right over there. See, the, the killer knocked him down coming into the stage. Now, why don't you question him? You're not kidding me, Sam. Kelsey, so help me, it's straight. All right, let's question him. Uh, you the doorman? Uh, yeah, yeah. He hit me right in the jaw. Just like that. Oh, no, you guys! You Kelsey, lie, for lie, heaven's lie, sake, lie. get up. Hitting oh. a police officer. I'll oh. have you arrested. I, uh, I'm I... sorry, officer. I'm terribly sorry it was you... an accident. I, I was just showing you how he hit me. Oh, oh, all right. But when you come to the shooting park, you be careful. Well, well the door opened and a big man barged through, see? Yeah. Uh, before I could open my mouth, he hit me. <laughs> and I fell flat on my back. Hmm. Have you got a good look at him? No, all I saw was a tattoo on the back of his hand. It was a red star. You mean he stood there and shot Manning and you didn't see him? Uh, as soon as he knocked me down, he put out the lights. And then he ran out. I started to get up and sort of car pull away. What kind of a car? It was a uh, light blue convertible. And you remember anything else? Absolutely nothing else. Are you sure? Absolutely sure. Uh, uh, oh, uh, I don't suppose it's worth much, but the, the license number was uh, 4N75323. No, I don't think... Oh, yeah. After you recovered from your apoplexy, Kelsey, and checked the license number, we were more confused than ever. Belonged to Cyrus Manning himself. While you were calling headquarters, I searched Manning, and the notes from which he was speaking were gone. I reasoned that he might have had a carbon copy or handwritten notes in his hotel room or wherever he lived. The Tribune supplied his address, the Congress on Fillmore above Van Ness, room 612. Coming out of the elevator, I bumped into a tall, handsome brunette hurrying in. Oh, oh, excuse me. It was my fault. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. If you go to the right, yeah. I'll go to the left. All right, ready? Shift. Going down. Oh, hurry, please. She was nice, but I had other things to worry about. No one answered Manning's door when I knocked just to see what might happen, so I let myself in. Before I even had time to look for any notes, I knew it wasn't any use because lying on the floor with his skull fractured was Dick Davis, late of the Tribune. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade.
90 minutes of comedy, music, and drama, all presided over by the glamorous Tallulah Bankhead. That's The Big Show, brought to you every Sunday on NBC. This Sunday's Big Show features such bright stars as Jack Carter, Jimmy Durante, Louis Calhern, Martha Ray, and many more. Plus music by Fran Warren and Meredith Wilson's Chorus and Orchestra. It's The Big Show. And Sunday over most of these NBC stations also means a one-hour adaptation of a famous play or story by Theater Guild on the air. This Sunday's Theater Guild production is Trilby, starring Rex Harrison and Teresa Wright. And now back to the Red Star Caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Cyrus Manning's room had been worked over thoroughly. There were no notes lying around which described the activities of anyone sending war material to the Chinese communists. The only pertinent piece of evidence was the corpse of Dick Davis. I didn't call your office right away, Kelsey, because I wanted to get out of there and begin asking some questions before the trail was cold. Strangely enough, in a man's hotel room, there were many items that belonged to a woman. Clothes, makeup, and so on. And they recalled to mind the girl I'd bumped into getting out of the elevator. And this recalled to me the elevator operator. I seen her coming up and down a few times. I know who she is. You know Manning when you saw him? Yeah, oh, I knew him, the celebrities. Hmm. But I can't remember, like, everybody. Was the girl ever with him that you remember? No, uh, not that I remember. Do you recall a short, dark, thin man coming up, name of Davis? They don't pay me to remember the people. I just get paid to take them up and down. And not very much, either. Hmm. Will this uh, help you remember anything? What ten bucks will do for your memory. A thin, dark man went up about 8.30. Didn't see him come down, though. He was alone. Good memory. Did anyone else in the elevator tonight stick in your mind? The uh, only guy I can remember is one who didn't look like he belonged here. Big. Had a pockmarked face. Huh? Oh, and on the back of one hand, he had a red star tattooed. Manning was going to reveal something about material being shipped to China. Shipped was the word I'd overlooked. And someone tattooed who looked as if he didn't belong in a good hotel and had the smell of a waterfront on him. So I slashed myself with cologne and went looking for the man who knows most about the strange smells of the waterfront. In fact, he's one of them. He's an indescribably low man, a fungus on the tree trunk of honesty, a spider in the lunch pail of lawfulness, porky grout, a stool pigeon. So low, he has to climb down a ladder to tie his shoelaces. I found him at the Blue Lantern Bar, took a capsule to settle my stomach, ordered a bottle and two glasses, and somehow forced myself to wave. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sam, well, if it ain't my old buddy, my old drinking pal, good time Charlie's trade. Buddy. You're pouring, Sam? <laughs> Porky. Uh, Porky, the other side of the table, please. I might need room in case of fire. I like it on this side, Sam. I can keep my eye on the window. All right, I'll move. Oh, Sam, Sam, you're too far away. I can hardly see now, you. Now, talk loud. Now, look, tell me something, Porky. Do you know anybody who's shipping stuff to China from here or someone with a red star tattooed on his hand? <coughs> mm. uh, I mean, just so dry, I don't think I could squeeze a word out of it. All right, here's one. Oh, uh, uh, you're a prince, Sam. <coughs> Please. Oh, it's still kind of dry, Sam. Okay. No, there's nobody like you, Sam. You're beautiful. Other oh. <coughs> way. Now, where was we? Who was I stooling on? Usually me, but if you can't think of anything else, try to remember where these drinks came from and talk accordingly. Uh, what do you want me to talk about, Sam? Uh, you better get me quick before my throat dries up now. Have you ever heard of anyone shipping war goods to China, Porky, or a man with a red star on his hand? Uh, ask me something else, Sam. I'd rather not answer that. We'll see if this changes your ethics. Uh, oh, not again. Oh, you're a prince, Sam. Now, let me see. Yeah. I heard about somebody shipping goods to the heathen Chinese, yeah. but I... Uh, uh, Sam, I, I gotta get going. I'll Boy, see you. Grout, come back here. I'm sorry, Sam. I just remembered I left something home on the stove. You don't have a home. I turned around to watch him scuttle out the door, and I saw for the first time what must have caused his haste. A face as evil as any I've seen these days outside of yours, Kelsey, was staring through the dirty window. The face moved for the door and entered. 
perched upon a big body under a sea cap. His arms were shoved into a pea jacket and his legs hit the floor like slow jackhammers as he walked toward me. You trying to pump information out of Grout, pal? Why else would anyone in his right mind give Porky Grout free drinks or stand that close to him? Who are you? What are you trying to find out? Frankly, it's none of your business. Look, pal, I grew up on the waterfront the hard way. I've knocked guys like you all over every port in the world. Now, don't make me mad. Why don't you make it easy and tell me who you are and what you want? I never answer questions. I just do the asking. Uh-huh. Are you going to tell me something or am I going to beat it out of you? Well, I guess it's going to have to be the hard way. Okay, pal. But just remember this. After I get through with you, I don't want never to see you down around here again. Because you bother me. <laughs> Now we come to the embarrassing part of my report, Kelsey. I did everything I usually do, but this time it didn't work. And now I know how those other puppies I batted around for the past few years feel. But all was not lost. It was a crashing right hand coming in from the side that did the damage. And it hit me right under my good eye. And on the back of that hand was tattooed a big red star. When I got up from the floor, he was gone. So was everyone else in the place but the bartender. Feel better now, mister? I told you not to have that last drink. What drink? Who was the guy who did it? Did what? Knock me down. What do you think? Oh, brother, you really got one on. I didn't see anybody knock you down. You didn't see a big red-headed guy in a pea jacket take a swing at me? Look, have a drink on the house. Maybe you'll feel better, huh? Don't give me that lost weekend routine. Who was he? Hey, stop. Let me go of me. I don't know what you're talking about. What happened to all those other people who were drinking here? Now, look, mister, you can believe it or not, the only two people I've served in here tonight... Have been you and Porky Grouch. And as for a guy knocking you down, well, you must have hallucinations. Threats, money, nothing worked. And I knew nothing would either because the sign had been put on me. So before anything more serious happened, I got out of there. And by there, I mean both the bar and the neighborhood. It was not that I was scared, but I'd long ago learned the value of an orderly retreat. Or as they used to say in my neighborhood when I was a kid... He who hits and runs away lives to hit another day. I decided to go at things from another angle, like who owned the woman's things that I saw in Cyrus Manning's room? They belong to Mr. Manning's wife. Burke, are you sure Manning had a wife? Well, they registered as man and wife, Mr. Spade. What did she look like? Tall, good-looking brunette. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, now that we're talking about her, there was something strange in their relationship. What? She never stayed here at night. She only came in in the morning and left in the afternoon. Do you know her first name or anything else about her? No, Mr. Spade, not another thing. Well, it was a start, at least. She was obviously the girl I'd met on the elevator. I looked up a number of Manning's friends, but the first three or four couldn't help me. But the fifth said that Manning had married about six months ago, and he'd never seen the wife. Her name, as he remembered, was Faye Kearney, and her father was a ship's captain. I ran down the name Kearney over at the maritime office and discovered that he owned three ships two of which were in port. On the first ship, the downwind, they told me Kearney lived on the other one. It was the Western Sun, a Pier 92. I went up the gangplank to the forward housing where the captain's cabin normally was located. Yes? Faye hey, Kearney? Yes, who are you? Remember me from the Congress Hotel? Elevator, sixth floor? I'm not sure. Oh, well, perhaps I should have called you Mrs. Cyrus Manning. Why don't you come in? Who? Sam Spade. I was hired as a bodyguard for your husband, but I got there too late. Yes. Everybody did. Mostly me. Oh, please don't cry just yet. Why do you say mostly me? I might have done something about it. Why were you running out of the hotel? I found Mr. Davis. Yes. Have you any idea who did it? Yes. Who? The same person who killed Sai. Who was that? Me, I suppose. Yeah, I'm really responsible. I caused the whole thing. The whole thing. She poured her misery out over my shoulder, and then she told me the whole story. She had met and married Cyrus Manning secretly against her father's will. When he found out, he took her aboard one of his ships and kept her prisoner. While she was aboard the ship, she found out what her father was doing carrying essential war material to communist China. So somehow, 
smuggled the information to Manning. She did, and the arrangement was that they were going to trade the information for a father's blessing on their marriage. But once Manning got the information, he wanted to scoop more than he did his wife. That's when the trouble started. Here he comes, Sam. Here he comes. You get out of the way. It's his time to hear it. Get in the back room. What are you doing here? Just came to pay you a visit. You should have learned your lesson the first time. This time it's for keeps, Sam. That's the way I feel. <laughs> I'm tempted, Effie. I'll say that much. Now, uh, go tight that up. Huh? All right, Sam, I Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and fun tomorrow on NBC to help your Saturday evening along. Your hit parade brings you the top tunes in the land with Raymond Scott, Snooky Lanson, and Eileen Wilson. The Dennis Day Show sparkles with songs and madcap adventures Starring charming, boyish Dennis Day. And Grand Ole Opry presents Red Foley and his friends in 30 minutes of music and laughter, Western style. Here it is, Sam. Believe me, I didn't enjoy typing it at all. I didn't expect that you would, F. As a matter of fact, it surprised me that you enjoy any of them. Oh, I never liked the killing part, Sam. Uh -huh. But sometimes you are the funniest people for clients, and... When I write down the things they say, I, I can't help but laugh. Well, if it makes you happy, I'll try to get more comedians for clients. In the meantime, you'll have to suffer along on whatever dregs of humanity the winds of fate blow into my office. Sam! Hmm? That was absolutely poetic. The winds of fate. Oh, it's nothing, nothing. I expect to appear in the next edition of Bartlett's Familiar Quotations. Now, would you like to hear one of my longer attempts at uh, poetic phrasing? Oh, yes, Sam. I'd love to hear it. Oh, good. This is called... Cigar. A cigar isn't far from a large cigarette in the raw material it employs. But the smoke is no joke, if you haven't learned yet, for it weeds out the men from the boys. Oh, Sam, that's mm. wonderful. Yes, I, uh... You ought to be able to sell that to someone. Effie, I can't even sell me. <laughs> Give me another one, Sam. All right. There was a young girl with a heart as big as the wheels on a cart. At the end of the day, she always would say... Good night, Sam. No, no. Good night, sweetheart. Oh, Sam, you're wonderful. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Loreen Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by John Michael Hayes. Musical scoring by Lud Bluskin, conducted by Robert Armbrister. again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Enjoy the magnificent Montague, then it's Duffy's Tavern on NBC.